Friends, a very warm welcome. It's lovely to see you. Uh, thank you for those of you who've joined us here in the Palace in Hereford for our IGM, <coughs> AGM, ICS AGM. Um, it's lovely to, to have you here. Um, I, it wasn't my suggestion that we met here. Richard suggested it, and I didn't exactly disagree with him too vehemently. <coughs> so, um, but it is good to be able to host you. This is um, the, the palace where we're meeting is the one of the, if not the oldest continuously inhabited buildings in the country. This is where we are at the moment. This hall is uh, part of a, a medieval hall that was built in uh, the 12th century. And uh, the beams that you can still see behind some of the uh, faux pillars that were put in by one of my predecessors uh, were acorns in the year 910. So we are uh, sitting as part of a significant history. I have to endure the fact that I'm being glowered at by a very grumpy looking predecessors, <laughs> uh, but uh, I've learned to live with that over time. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to, uh, to welcome you here to our annual AGM. And for those of you on Zoom, it's lovely to see you. Well, I can't see you, but I'm assuming that you're all sitting there in front of your computers. You're very, very welcome to join us. And uh, we hope and pray that the technology will not desert us and that we'll remain connected for the duration of uh, our time together. But uh, might I pray to begin our meeting. Our gracious Father, we do thank you for the privilege of being called into your service. We thank you for uh, ICS, particularly as we approach now our 200th uh, anniversary. We thank you for all the lives that have been changed and the disciples that have been grown through the ministry of this organization. We thank you, Lord, for uh, being called to be part of the ongoing stewardship of this missionary work. And Lord, as we gather, we pray that you would open our eyes to all that your spirit is doing, that we might celebrate and give thanks together. And Lord, that by your grace, you would guide us as we look to the future, uh, as to what you're calling us to do, to play our part uh, in building the kingdom of God and introducing others to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And this we ask in his name. Amen. 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 Well, without further ado, um, I'd love to introduce uh, Deborah Chapman, uh, who is in Barcelona. Uh, and with her husband, John, leads uh, the church there, ICS Church there. Um, so I'm hoping that with the wonders of technology, Deborah will join us and is going to give share um, some thoughts from the scriptures with us. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello. I hope you can all hear me. And I do have a PowerPoint, which I hope to share, but I seem to have gone off my screen, the full screen I had before. Let me just see. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay. Do you remember Richard Bromley telling us to come closer? There are many shades of meaning to that phrase, but I believe that when applied to Jesus, it conveys intimacy with him, which in turn enables us to be sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, because Jesus opens our eyes to the unseen to what causes seen effects in the world around us, effects that are very real. What is real? The seen versus the unseen. What have you come to this AGM to see? Will you go away having seen it? Or will more be hidden from your sight than is revealed? When we celebrate Jesus' first coming as a human being, we often forget what a hidden drama the whole thing was. In fact, the most momentous occasion in each one of our lives is hidden, and that is our conception. There has got to be a beginning. In our family, we chuckle when we tell the story of our son, Matthew, who once wrote in a general letter to his friends that he was going back to Peru, the country where he was conceived. The parables told by Jesus in Mark chapter four, for example, are all about the unseen, the parable, the a lamp on a stand, the growing seed, the mustard seed. 
It is a great mystery, even if one understands the scientific processes enough to describe them, how that thing we call life can cause a seed to sprout and grow. And without us doing anything, we're not needed. That is what the kingdom of God is like, the reign or rule of God. It happens. It is just there. God rules. We cannot do anything about it. We might plant a seed, so to speak, but the after effects happen of their own accord. We cannot control them. There's an unseen power working without our will that causes the seed to grow and bless us with a harvest. The changes that take place transform what was there in the beginning into something completely different. And though we cannot see it, that is what God is doing in us and to us as we allow him to. The unseen is more real than the seen. We have faith in the real, though the real be mysterious. For the Apostle Paul, the unseen was definitely more real than the seen. In 2 Corinthians 5, he tells us, Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. This is similar to what Paul says in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Since what is unseen is more real, he continues, so we make it our goal to please him, that is God in Christ, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. That goal of pleasing him is an inner desire, very real, but still unseen. Our desires our motivations map out how we respond to everything that happens in our lives, changing what is seen by what is unseen. Let me give you an example. Look at what happened to the first two kings that Samuel anointed in obedience to God. Saul's heart was full of jealousy towards David. He was insecure as a, as a king. He didn't trust God and tried to take things into his own hands. That jealousy twisted his heart with bitterness. That reality in him affected everything around him, causing him to stop thinking straight. He even thought those who loved him most, like his son Jonathan and David himself, were against him. He became paranoid. David, on the other hand, was confident of who he was in relationship with God, and he honored Saul as God's anointed king. At one point, his brother Eliab thinks that he is being boastful because David asked those standing near him, what will be done for the one who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Eliab burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Have you ever had wrong motives ascribed to you? What is inside is what is real. The very same words can be said from two different motivations. David's heart was full of trust in God and God knew it. Human beings look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God is into making new creations. He changes everything. Paul tells us, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. The unseen has taken root in your heart, and God has transformed you by the renewing of your mind. Just as the wind blows and you don't see it, but you see its effects, the Holy Spirit in you is changing you according to God's will. I wonder what God has hidden in you. What is he growing in you as the spirit hovers over you and lives in you? When what God began in Mary is revealed to her cousin Elizabeth, she bursts into song. In what is commonly known as the Magnificat, Mary sings, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. God does it. He does it mindful of the humble state of his servant. God is much more able to work in us if we are truly humble. 
That does not mean going around in a Uriah Hebish way. It means having a right view of ourselves, blessing God because all we have and are comes from him. It means being all too aware of our weaknesses, as Paul was when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made per perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. All through the scriptures, the promise for the future salvation of God's people is to a people who are weak. We cannot save ourselves. Isaiah 35, strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Our strength is in our God. This is also our hope. As we wait for Jesus coming in glory that we are anticipating, James reminds us to be patient. He compares the wait to the farmer waiting for the seed hidden in the ground to grow. What is hidden will come to light as a crop comes to light after the autumn and spring rains. And we are to be patient because the Lord's coming is near. James then becomes very practical. He says, don't grumble against each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. This means that we face our shortcomings, including our hidden faults, because when he comes, everything that is hidden will come to light. Jesus puts it this way, for there's nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Mark Stibbe has called chapters 13 to 21 of John's gospel, the departure of Jesus, and chapters 13 to 17, specifically the farewell. In chapter 14, the headings are, Jesus comforts his disciples, Jesus, the way to the Father, and Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. Jesus' last words to his disciples just before chapter 15 are, come now, let us leave. A more exact translation would be, let us go to meet the advancing enemy. Jesus has just asserted that the prince of this world is coming. Now the disciples are to go and engage him. It is a call to arms. I am the true vine explains how we can know that we will be victorious in the battle that each one of us will face in this life. The image of the vine would have been recognized by all of Jesus' listeners because it was the supreme symbol of Israel, a symbol that appears over and over again in the Old Testament, Psalm 80 in particular. It is a symbol representing those that belong to God the Father, but where Israel had not been faithful in the God-given task of reaching all of the nations of the world, Jesus contrasts himself as the true vine, through him that task would be achieved. I've illustrated this with a beautiful painting by the contemporary Romanian glass painter, Timote Tohanianu. He has entitled the painting, Jesus, Life of All Life. The Lord Jesus Christ is depicted here as the vine of life encircling the cross. He is squeezing the grapes into a chalice telling us that the wine we receive at communion symbolizes his blood, his life. Life, even our life, is in the blood. When I first saw this picture, I thought of Jesus as creator. Everything that lives, lives because of him in the first place. The Bible tells us that he is the creator, Colossians 1 and John 1. Jesus is the author of life in the first place, and in this picture, he is very much alive despite the cross behind him. But he is also the author of life in the second place. I noticed that the branches were coming out of his side where he was pierced for our transgressions, as the Bible tells us. Not only does Jesus give life in creation, he gives life back to us as we are forgiven for the sins that take life away from us. So the life in all its fullness that he gives flows out with the life he gave on our behalf, crucified on the cross. Without that, we cannot have life again. The vine lives to give its lifeblood. 
Its only purpose is to bear fruit. Again, it is a hidden process, but without it, we have no hope of life. What is Jesus sitting on? He is sitting on what could be the tomb where he was placed and from which he rose to life. But since he is very much alive, it is also the table to which he invites every one of us to come to drink the wine that he is squeezing out of the fruits of the vine. He is looking straight towards us and saying, come, I am preparing some wine for us all to share. I am the true vine. Come to me and live. God the Father knows what he is doing with us. If he disciplines us, rounding off the sharp corners of our lives, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course, shows us where we've gone wrong and how to live right, it is because he loves us. He is pruning us like a gardener prunes the vine so that we bear more fruit. He is getting rid of the useless bits of us and cutting back on those areas that may not be bad, but have gone wildly and with no discipline all over the place. He wants us to be focused on priorities in life, closer to the center, Jesus, the vine, getting all we need from him to produce huge quantities of life, because the battle is a battle between life and death. Wine represents life, and Jesus wants us to be alive and to give life to others. That's a really old vine in the picture. When it comes to bearing fruit for God, age doesn't matter. It's all about how well that vine has been tended. If we are a branch attached to Jesus and the gardener, God our Father, has been allowed to do his work in us, we will bear much fruit. There's no ageism with God. I love the word remain. It has a rooted feel to it, a permanent sound. To remain somewhere is not to budge from that spot. If we follow Jesus nearly, no matter where we are physically, we will always know that assurance of remaining where he is, and we will bear fruit. Apart from him, we will bear nothing. It is in this context that Jesus says, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. What the branch wishes will, of course, be exactly what the vine wishes. There can be no contradiction. In order for our prayers to be answered, all we need to do is be more and more connected to Jesus. Answered prayer is much fruit. It is our faithful produce. God wants that kind of intimate relationship with us where he and I and he and each one of you see eye to eye. The fruit is the gardener's glory. Answered prayer is to God our Father's glory. Prayer is where we do battle with the enemy and win. As God prunes us, disciplines us so that we are changed, as Romans 12, 2 puts it, as we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, then and only then will we be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is what results in answered prayer to the glory of God and makes it clear that we really do belong to him. This is how we can be sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Amen. Very early in my role in, in ICS, I got the opportunity to go along and interview and recruit and then go and present uh, John and Deborah Chapman. Uh, John as, as it was at the time, but both of them took up roles in different ways, uh, both ordained. And so I said to them, as I was there in Barcelona with them, having a meal on the street, I should come here and see you more often. I mean, who would not say that about Barcelona? That. Um, and it's never <laughs> happened. But it is my joy to still be in touch with John and, and Deborah and to enjoy what they're doing. So John is going to tell us something about the ministry of uh, the Church St. George's in Barcelona. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for the invitation uh, to join today. Uh, seven years we've been here now in Barcelona. Uh, yes, it's quite nice. The temperature outside is 28 degrees at present. Uh, and uh, is very comfortable with a nice sea air coming in from the Mediterranean. Uh, I want to begin by just saying a little bit about our clergy team. Uh, I'm chaplain for Barcelona and Andorra. And uh, Deborah is assistant chaplain. And so... 
mainly responsible for Andorra, so we'll, she'll be taking that part. And we now have another clergy person, Rhea, who is uh, an ordained priest of the Finnish Lutheran Church and has permission to officiate with us. So we have a team of three clergy as well as all our lay people at present, uh, which is a real privilege. St. George's Barcelona, which is the window that you're seeing uh, from our website, this is what it says. We are an international Anglican church who have worshiped in this beautiful city since the mid 1800s. We're united in Christ, celebrating our diversity and unity. We give thanks for the variety of people in our community and for all those who visit us and bless us with their presence. It is a privilege to be world Christians, a house of prayer for all nations. St. George's is a church of over 30 nationalities, with both our church wardens being from the US, our administrator from Canada and New Zealand, and our council from six different countries. I'm going to continue with a little bit about Andorra. It really was accidental in the beginning that I ended up serving them regularly once a month in that John was supposed to go and he couldn't. And he said, well, my wife is ordained. Do you mind if she comes? And they said, no, send her. So now I'm there regularly. Uh, this is from their website. St. George's is part of the Anglican Church and is the English speaking church of Andorra. We welcome and invite worshipers from all denominations to take an active part in our services and everybody to both attend our services and take part in our events and activities. From January 2017, we've become a worship center of St. George's Barcelona under the supervision and guidance of its resident chaplain, with Reverend Deborah Chapman taking specific responsibility for visiting us regularly as well. This change enables us to dispense with certain local responsibilities, such as appointing church wardens and church council, and to function with a small worship service committee and a treasurer. The change in status will help us reach out to people in the community as we will have regular visits for longer periods from the same chaplain who can thus get to know us and our community and help us with outreach activity. And I hope they have had their desires from their website blurb fulfilled because I really, really enjoy going to Andorra. Um, I like to spend at least a weekend there because that way I can visit people, get to know them. And we do have a group called CORE, which means heart in Catalan, of young women who cannot attend the church service, but who do Lectio Divina together. And that's really their way of worshiping. So that's a bit about me and going to Andorra. So where are we today? Uh, Barcelona during this time of the pandemic. On the 4th of March, 2020, I was representing the English speaking Anglican church because there's also a, a Spanish speaking Anglican church, uh, the Iglesia, Iglesia Española, um, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> Iglesia Episcopal Reformada Española, or Espanol. the other way around, Iglesia That's right. Española Reformada Episcopal. Yeah. So I was representing the English speaking Anglican church at the annual meeting of Ferredi, which is the organization that represents all non Roman Catholic groups uh, to the government here in Spain. And there on the 4th of March, I heard the first conversations about COVID. By the 13th, just nine days later, we were in complete lockdown. On the 2nd of March, Deborah had returned from services uh, in Andorra in a joint ski weekend between St. George's Barcelona and Andorra, and was heading out for two weeks uh, with our son and family in Australia. And, uh, and that was how she arrived back two months later. Uh, what was a two week visit became two months and, and courtesy of the Spanish government uh, who put on a special flight from Sydney, she returned home. When lockdown began, we decided to call it a time of cloistering as in a monastery, a time to walk with God, to talk with him, to listen to him. Different pers personalities have found the lockdown easier or harder. And we knew it was important to take each person seriously, particularly if they found it difficult and we didn't. We had the online services like Monday, Thursday and Easter services as most churches did at that time. 
But what did this do for our church? I want to take a few areas in the 20 minutes allotted to me uh, to highlight. I think it gave time to pray, space to pray. It gave us space to think, space to discover new ways of being. It may be that WhatsApp and Zoom, in actual fact, have created more relationships between people than we ever had before. Number one, space to pray. We live above the Church of St. George's here in Barcelona, and in the apartment above us is our youth worker, uh, who was joined during COVID by our Ministry Experience Scheme intern, who came from the Netherlands, and finally by our music coordinator, who is from Mexico. And we decided to call this the St. George's Community House. And right from the beginning, we met for morning and evening prayers. And the project was undertaken to turn our audiovisual balcony into a place for prayer. We were blessed by a beautiful window that you saw earlier. Um, and someone had suggested that we continue the colors of the window on the wall of the prayer room. And Debbie and Jenny, our youth worker, have done just that. So for a place for people just to relax and pray with God. It was also though a, a place to change. In normal church life in this busy chaplaincy, we seem to simply continue with the issue of maintenance. Even mission can be done in a maintenance mode. Cloistering gave us the opportunity to think and for things to bubble up, especially creatively. Garden that was far from beautiful. In fact, our occasional gardener said it was a crime what we didn't do with our garden. And one of the great projects of this time was to turn it into a place of beauty that you can see now. Uh, we don't have a comparison, unfortunately, or you'd see how much we've already done. Trees and bushes were cut back to allow more space for our buds to bloom. And John bought me a new toy to do this with, a Ryobi extendable chainsaw. Um, Jenny and I kept to a schedule of garden work from eight to 9 a.m. most mornings during the lockdown and on into the pandemic after that. Uh, there's now a memorial garden and the plaque remembering my parents was the first to go up. You don't see it in that picture, it's gone up since. Um, and the second was uh, for the mum of a member who now lives in Ghana. And we have now made it available for anybody who would like to remember their loved ones. My parents were members of the church in the 70s and the 80s. And we have painted walls now with the I am sayings of John's gospel done by members of the church, particularly children. But what we've been doing in this very creative time um, is inviting families when we could only have one bubble at a time, we invite one family to come and paint part of an I am saying. In fact, the only one that's finished the first one, I am the light of the world. We're still working on the others, but it's been great fun. The positive response to this has been far beyond our anticipating. Someone said to me last Sunday that it was this, this was prophetic, as more and more of our ministry has taken place in the garden. In 2022, we celebrate 50 years of the present church building and over 150 years of the chaplaincy here in, in Barcelona. And much of our, what we're calling St. George's Gala Year, we hope will be celebrated outside. The third thing we want to reflect on is the space to be. We couldn't really do all that much during the beginning of the pandemic at least, but we could be. Um, St. George's and Dora also had garden church, but in that case, it was in the back garden of a member, Brenda Ross, with whom I stay every month who loves using her garden both for Saturday Bible study and Sunday services, as well as parties and the annual church garden party to which we invite many other people. And we have carried on actually. Uh, none of the planned events of that kind have had to change. Um, CORE has been meeting next to a stream. That's the group I already mentioned of Lectio Divina. 
Our St. George's Barcelona, our worship area downstairs could not be seen from our mezzanine um, because it was boarded up. Oh, sorry, here's another one of Andorra. Because it was boarded up and during this time with more space to be, we were able to raise funds to put windows in so that the space could be seen, uh, the whole church could be seen from the mezzanine. And also it's turned out as we're looking at going back into our building, it gives space to use the upstairs uh, for people to sit. Barcelona, we're still in quite stringent situations. We have to mask when we're within 1.5 meters of anyone outside. Inside, we always have to be masked uh, and a uh, distance of 1.5 meters in any bubble. Um, we have no option on that. It's the law of our place. And, and people here in Barcelona take it very smoothly. There's a lovely atmosphere around. And this has enabled us to be able to develop as well as make the place more beautiful. We were concerned that uh, outside, we had a very small area in front of our church and the people were being too close together after the services and this was causing some anxiety. So we were able to raise money and it's not completely finished yet, as you can see, but to ex extend an area outside that people can sit and be, enjoy coffee together and uh, feel safe uh, because feeling safe for worship is an important part of being able to focus uh, on our Lord. It also gave the opportunity to think about safeguarding. And we went round our building and looking at where we had solid doors that uh, could be a danger in terms of uh, behavior going on inside that wasn't being observed. And so we were able to change three doors uh, and turn them into doors with glass. Important for a part of our loving community in safeguarding others. And so, as time went on, we knew that people needed a safe place to be. Our Sunday school and youth group had decided a number of months before uh, the pandemic started to build a tabernacle. Uh, and here was the Ark of the Covenant and a portable tabernacle. It was designed to be destroyed after a few months, but it's become our altar during the whole of our pandemic. Our children's church were able to continue with having extra space inside, but with uh, limited numbers. And the garden has become our place of worship. This was Pentecost, uh, as we were able to worship God outside. Spaciousness, prayer change, new ways of learning to be lovingly safe. All these mark the days of COVID. Baptism taking place by the entrance to our church. This was a family where the man is from Belarus and the woman from Moscow. And on the wall, I am the true vine. There are still challenges. We still have to be masked and distanced. How should we order services when we have to move inside during our gentle Mediterranean winter? Some key workers have left Barcelona during the pandemic and we have not yet seen the new people coming that we normally would. The caution of people, particularly with young families, or if they are very vulnerable, means that we will have to help people recreate habits of physically working together. Finally, my tendency is to think that I have to work extra hard to get this right. As Deborah reminds me, both in her talk earlier and verbally, this is God's church. And our task is to journey with him. Pray with us that we be truly faithful. I want to finish with a story of one young lady who recorded this for us during Lent. Her name is Wanjiku and she is from Kenya. Hi, my name is Wanjiku Mwenda. I am a Kenyan, I come from Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, I have been in uh, Barcelona since the 24th of October, 2020. The reason I'm doing this video is just to share briefly how my journey has been and my stay in Barcelona has been. First of, this is my first time in Barcelona. 
and it's a beautiful place. I have always heard about Barcelona. I have traveled to other places, but I've not been to Spain before. And even more is that this is the first time that I have been away from my family for quite a long time. I came to Barcelona as a student. I'm pursuing a master's in sports management right now. I have just begun my second semester. And um, the question I get a lot is, what has been your experience about Barcelona? And um, what did you expect to see? My experience has been amazing. Reason being is I'm seeing it for the first time, so I'm seeing it in fresh eyes. I have nothing to compare it with. I don't know how Barcelona looked like before the pandemic, but what I am seeing now to me is all I know. And for me, the Lord has been faithful enough to just give me an experience of calmness and peace, even in the midst of this pandemic. Was it difficult traveling and settling here? Yes, because of the pandemic, the traveling uh, restrictions and all that is going on around the globe, getting a visa and coming here was quite a hassle. But the Lord was faithful, and finally I got it here. I got myself to Barcelona. Settling down, um, yeah, because it's a strange, it's, 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 a, it's a different new language. I have to learn first. You're thrown into the deep sea very quickly. You have to learn a few words here and there to at least integrate with the people on ground. So that one was quite a hassle in the beginning, but right now at least I can speak a few words here and there and communicate accordingly, at least. But the most intriguing bit of my Barcelona journey so far is that the Lord led me to this beautiful church, the St. George's Barcelona Church. For three weeks, I stayed in my apartment, not going to church, just listening online and watching a different um, services online. But through a friend, I, get, I, I came to know about St. George's Barcelona. And I came here. And I was, I was happy with what I saw. First, I met an English speaking church. Secondly, I met a family of very many people who are going through the same thing that I'm going through, being away from home, but yet have a family away from family. And the most interesting bit is that the friends and the uh, relationships that I have made and friendships that I have made in Barcelona so far have been from friends and with friends from church and not school. You know, it's intriguing how. My schoolmates, yes, we are colleagues, we work well, but those that I call my friends now are from church. And it is so, it's such a warm feeling because then you have one common goal. You're working in the same direction and um, you speak the same language. You speak about God. It is humbling to share the word of God with people. And I also enjoy the Bible studies on Saturdays. I actually look forward to them. And I'm grateful that St. George's listened to our plea to have a Bible study on Saturdays because of in between the week I can't, I'm in school. And I'm grateful, really grateful that I found this family. God bless you, all of you. Those that I've never said hi to, maybe through this video I am. But I'm grateful that I found you. Thank you. Wanjiku's mother uh, in Kenya died a few weeks after that because of COVID. She was unable to return home uh, just because travel was not possible at that time. We know the suffering, all of us, of this time. Um, but let us, however, recognize it's a time when God's hand has been at work and a time when we have seen blessing. Let us never forget to learn to live lives of gratitude. We have a great God. And uh, thank you for allowing us to be with you. Amen.